Welcome to the Spa Retailer Podcast, where we talk about retail, business, and all things related to the hot tub industry. Here's your host, Megan Kendrick. Hey, this is Megan here. I just wanted to jump in before we get to this week's episode. I actually recorded this conversation with Jim Van Fleet last May, so some of the time references may seem a little off to those of you who know about Jim and his story. I apologize it took me this long to get this up, but as one of the first things we recorded for the podcast, there were some audio issues that it took me a while to figure out. So I am so happy that I can finally bring you this great interview with Jim. Here it is. Welcome to the Spa Retailer Podcast. I am Megan. Today I'm talking to Jim Van Fleet, owner of Mainly Tubs in Portland, Maine. Hello, Jim. Hi, Megan. How are you today? I'm doing great. The topic we're going to talk about is I used to introduce myself for 25 years as the owner. I still do when I make a mistake, but now, as it turns out, I'm one of 40 owners of Mainly Tubs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as some of you may have heard, Jim recently launched an ESOP, an Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Um, So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get into kind of the nitty gritty of that, Uh, Could you just tell us a little bit about how you got into the hot tub industry? For those who don't know, what's your origin story as it is? (laughs) Thanks. It's um, probably not an unusual one. Um, I worked as a banker out of college for seven years, went back and got an MBA, um, worked for a land conservation forestry outfit for 10 years, then a small um, business, mapping business here in Maine uh, for oh, five years as their CFO. And um, the entrepreneurial bug bit me when I, uh, a friend of mine happened to find that uh, a small little hot tub store in Portland, Maine was for sale. He thought I might like to buy it. Turns out he was a realtor and he got the listing and and uh, blindsided me by saying, "Hey Jim, you don't need to buy a hot tub. You need to buy the company." <laughs> <laughs> How so long is that in itself? It's a fun story, but that was uh, uh, 25 years ago now. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So you have had this store for 25 years. Yep, I, I, I guess next year is the 25th year, uh, precisely. But uh, I bought an existing business. It was just a small little one and a half person business uh, that had been started in 1978. It was the first business ever in the state of Maine that had been called mainly something, M-A-I-N-E-L-Y, using the state of Maine, in this case, mainly tubs. So, so it was a fun little opportunity to see whether or not, having worked for others uh, my entire life, whether I could actually work for myself. <laughs> So an ESOP, um, you know, as someone who has their MBA, this is something that you definitely will be much more well-versed in than, than I am. <laughs> so I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that we have you to help guide this conversation. Um, can you, it's ex- certainly helpful. Um, many business owners are already on top of their kind of financial world and it does help to know the ins and outs of your company's finances. Um, and, and that often happens with growth because you have to talk to bankers or you have to talk to other financial people or vendors. So a lot of owners are already predisposed and probably have some of the skill sets that are necessary in order to study it properly. Yeah, you would imagine. So, um, could you just explain what exactly an ESOP is um, and kind of why it was something that you thought was a good option for your company? Um, absolutely. An ESOP actually stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Okay. And it's, it's, a, it's another um, ERISA-sponsored opportunities that large companies and small have one of the largest uh, ESOP uh, employee owned companies in the country is public supermarkets. It's a, uh, it's not probably national, but it's um, a regional big shopping um, food shopping center. Sure. And it's owned by all of its employees. And there are probably 50 ESOPs 
um, companies that are owned by their employees in the state of Maine. So I had some uh, some pre-knowledge of other companies' experience, and I researched that with some of those companies so I could understand its applicability to me. Um, but there's a certain minimum threshold that's necessary to be able to consider an ESOP in the first place. Um, and there needs to be a kind of a minimum size. Many of uh, the experts in the field will tell you you need somewhere between a, a four and five hundred thousand dollar payroll in order to set up a proper ESOP and to have the financial underpinnings of a company to be able to buy the consultants necessary in order to do an ESOP. Um, but it's governed and it has rules that are established by the federal government and administered by the Department of Labor under the ERISA. If you know 401k plans, for instance, they're all ERISA sponsored plans. Okay. And an ESOP, an ESOP is really kind of a 401k plan on steroids, if you will. And the steroids come from the idea that the only stock that this plan owns is the company stock for which you work. So there's a trustee involved that negotiates on behalf of all of the employees to ensure that the owner who's selling the business does so at an arm's length transaction and the employees aren't overpaying for the company and the owner has to negotiate to be happy that he is assured that uh, he's not being underpaid for his company. So it's a a fair market value transaction occurs with an independent trustee who has valuation folks. And, and so it can be um, a drawn out. It took me uh, probably eight months in order to do it. And my company was already at, uh, at the time at over 9 million in revenue. So we had the, we had oh, almost a $2 million payroll. So we had the, um, we were of the size that we qualified. An important other consideration was that over the years, I'm almost 70, and so I have established within my company a group of managers who are responsibility who are responsible for certain areas, um, sales, um, um, administration, finance, a, a general manager. So I had an established management group who a valuation company and a trustee could see might be able to manage this business going forward if I weren't around anymore or if I retired. And I think that's a really critical piece because if you're looking for value for your business, then you must prove to somebody who is totally independent, who looks at multitudes of business uh, businesses that um, for this very purpose, that your company is a viable company, whether you're around or not. So I would counsel other owners in our industry to carefully weigh the advantages of building up a management team um, who allow the company to be run without the owner to being there 100% of the time. So this is, you know, part of an exit strategy for you so that, you know, when you decide to retire and step away from the business, you have, you have a plan in place. Um, were there other options that you looked at before you decided on, on doing an, an ESOP? When did you kind of decide that this was the, the way that you should go? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, probably six years ago, I started to consider when I was, um, approaching 65, um, I started to think about what might happen. I have two children, uh, one of whom has worked in the business for a while, but is seeking other pursuits, just um, wants to set his own path. And congratulations to my daughter, the same. Um, so I had to start to think about what my options were. Oh, six years ago, I hired an, um, an M&A firm to value the business. That's always a first and useful step, even before you start to engage in considering an ESOP, trying to get some sense of value and send some sense of the marketability of your company. And so I, I don't know, I paid $20,000, $25,000 for evaluation um, of our company. 
And I started to, as a result, understand what our options were. That company advised me on how and who to market the company to if I were to sell it privately. And part of their advice was in our industry, we're a more a niche business than we are uh, a mainstream business. And so as with many niche businesses, Megan, the, there aren't as many potential buyers who, one, know the details, the ins and outs of our industry, or two, know enough about the product category or the services that we offer to, to feel comfortable. So the fact that there it were limited options to sell it privately um, was one factor. Uh, a second factor has always been I've tried to be, because I don't have commission plans, I have profit sharing plans historically in which every when we're successful, everybody shares in that success. And so I sort of have this philosophy that it's been now almost 40 people, and, you know, it's built up over time, who have really made this company the success that it is. I, um, I, I know there are a multitude of uh, hot tub customer co companies in this country who think of themselves as the best retail hot tub company in the world. I happen to be among that group. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um, I, of course, in, encourage my people with those kinds of laudatory comments and they work really hard and they work really smart. And, you know, how in a small market do you become the largest volume hot spring store in the world 13 times, you know, in less than a half a million uh, population with, and, and have a market share that we have unless those people weren't working really hard. Well, I felt as if they'd created a value in this business and they needed to share in that in some way that might be a win-win. And so that was part of my goal was to see if their jobs could be protected. Oftentimes in private industry, when there's an acquisition, the new company's management comes in, there are uh, jobs that are lost, there are management people who must move on. And, and so that doesn't necessarily bode well for the camaraderie and team that's left or for the continuity of service to, in our case, 22,000 customers. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do right by your customers and your staff, this kind of transaction offers a win, win, win all the way around for the selling uh, shareholder, for the, um, for the employees, as well as the customers. And that's what I like best about it. I think one of our challenges in business is, um, hiring good people. And that doesn't matter what business you're in. Um, in today's age, it's very hard to find good people. And an ESOP has yet another benefit because, and now that we're you know, four or six months into it, I'm learning from some of our new hires that that was one of the things they look at as they consider where to take a job and where to apply is that um, employee ownership is attractive to people who are looking for jobs who might be willing to look for a job that's longer than a year or two at a time. So one way for us to attract better, more and better candidates for employment is to put a plan like this in place. So it sounds like in a way it was kind of a natural progression of some of the things you already had in place with the, with the profit sharing and just sort of your business philosophy, it sounds like. It absolutely was. It sort of once I started to um, study it, um, I, you know, it was very eye opening. And I said, "Wow, is it possible that through through everybody winning, I could ob obtain s sufficient value for my twenty five years of work that I might someday be able to retire?" <laughs> <laughs> But do you but do yeah. you want to retire, Jim? That is the real question because at you know at sixty eight, sixty nine years old, um, you kind of don't show very many signs of slowing down, from what I can tell. <laughs> well, I, you know, I really uh, everybody likes to be successful, and everybody likes to, in, as I do, I like to lead a successful company. So that's very exciting. There's a lot of energy around our business, and so you're right. I 
you know, when the bank and the trustee said, well, we like your management team, but we think if we're going to get involved, and there was a bank involved here too. I'll describe that to you if you'd like. But um, if, if they said, if we're going to loan you this kind of money, we think it's important for you to hang out for a while. Sure. Well, well the, the hangout turned into be a required employment contract. But, you know, that fit perfectly for me because I didn't want a cliff exit. I wanted a ramp exit. And sure. so this kind of transaction lends itself to that and allows me to keep, continue to nurture people along to be uh, really good at what we do. Yeah, I imagine that, that uh, the ramp as opposed to the cliff would be attractive to a lot of business owners because this is, you know, these businesses are in some ways your your children. You you spend so much time and energy and, and love, you know, building this thing. And I think it would be really hard just to, uh, you know, one day turn it over and that be it. Yeah. And, and, um, and the reality of, of selling a business, whether it's selling to an ESOP or to a private entity or a merger or anything, the reality is that an owner has to expect that he's going to have to take some financing back. And sure there for good and strong companies, a bank might be willing to be involved and some banks might even be willing to be involved to 30 or 40 percent of the deal it, you know there are personal guarantees that you have to try and negotiate but to the extent that um you know there you're going to have to finance as an owner some of the transaction it, it, it really does focus you on wine wanting to be sure that it does indeed continue to be successful so that after the bank is paid you can get paid <laughs> so you know it's like any a business sale where an owner takes paper back and that paper you have to meet certain covenants in order for those um, principal payments to be paid. You talked about doing the, the valuation of the business. Um, were there some other steps that you had to take before you even uh, started to get the ESOP set up? Were there things that you sort of needed to get in order in your in your finances or in your company, employees, anything like that that you had to do as sort of a next step? Well, the, the um, I think we we probably helped set examples there. You know, one of the things I did years ago was with Watkins uh, Manufacturing is help and participate in this Gemini program, which is a program in which owners learn, I learned a lot about it in business, but also in school, about what are the important financial criteria that are necessary in order to run a good business, and and what are the mileposts and guidelines of doing so. Um, it, it is really, it's extremely important um, that people pay close attention to that, because ultimately, at the end of the day, when you are attentive to that, you start to build a company that has some value. A company that has no, no management structure, is loosely governed and sort of um, gets whatever it gets in the marketplace for sales any particular year is not a good candidate for an ESOP and for this kind of transaction. Um, you really, if you're going to build value in a company for everybody involved, there's a lot more rigor to it. And the Gemini group was terrific. The membership there, Dave Riley really keeps us focused uh, on all the proper things to do to lay the groundwork for how to build a good and strong and growing organization. We focus a lot on those things over the years. Okay. And, you know, people who are regular readers of the magazine um, will definitely recognize Dave Riley's name. He, he's written a column for us for, for many years and has provided a lot of those um, tips and, and milestones and things for businesses to pay attention to in the magazine. And it's been uh, some of our favorite articles over the year have come from him, come from him on those particular topics for sure. There are um, the, the the financial benefits um, for uh, an owner are, um, of course, at, at some point, if you've got a bank involved, then there's some portion of the front end transaction becomes a payment for a portion of the stock and the balance with a note over time. So 
that with a good organization, you can, in fact, achieve what are average multiples in retail or better, you know, the average um, multiple by that. I mean, the price as a function of earnings, you know, think about like a stock in the stock market. Average retail multiples are roughly three times uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That term is called EBITDA. Um, That's not a mouthful. (laughs) It is a mouthful. Um, and, and the values in across the board in all retail have historically been somewhere around a three multiple. So an example would be if you have a business that um, that nets um, uh, after taxes a hundred thousand, then that company might be worth three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand, or you know. But that would if it were a very you know if it were a streamlined company that was did had earnings that were a high percentage of revenue, then you might get a higher than three multiple. But so tr- trying to understand what's in it for the owner is also important because at some point, if you even if you have family succession, then at most of the time, an owner whose family is succeeding her or him is going to need to retire and have some sort of retirement nest egg. And so there has to be some understanding between family members, between business partners, between buyers and sellers, whether ESOP or private, of what the value of the underlying enterprise is. And so to start to pay attention to that, which I did, oh, 10 years ago with real seriousness of purpose, is a critical path. You've explained an ESOP and the basics of an ESOP to us pretty well. We're going to uh, take a break and be back with Jim in our next episode um, where he will give us more details about his ESOP and how he got it set up. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Um, If you have not downloaded the Spa Retailer app, please do so. It's really great. Uh, Thank you, Jim, for chatting with us today. We have got more to come on this topic, so check back in soon. You've been listening to the Spa Retailer Podcast. You can download previous episodes on iTunes, Google Play, or at sparetailer.com slash podcast. Be sure to download the Spa Retailer app where you can also listen to the podcast and get access to all the magazine articles as well as exclusive content.